Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Essential Works for Beginners by Benjamin Britten. Now, Benjamin Britten was possibly, well, you know, you know, what am I going to say? The greatest this, the greatest that. Yeah, a very, very great composer. Um, one of the greatest English composers of the 20th century. Uh, he was primarily a composer of operas and of works for the voice. And that means if you don't like singing in English and if you don't like operatic voices, you're going to have a problem with Britain. Not that there isn't other stuff you can listen to. There is. But if you really want to get into what he was about, you really have to enjoy opera and opera singing. And there's no way around that. So I'm saying that straight out. We're talking about mostly vocal music and a few other things besides. And I think that, you know, it's all a question of just getting used to it. Britain's own writing for the voice was usually pretty grateful. Um, it was it was clear. It was he, he chose, generally speaking, pretty fine texts to listen to, and so it's uh, a pleasure to hear his music for the voice. And the six works here will give you a perfectly fine introduction to both his vocal and non-vocal music. So don't worry. There are some enormously popular things he wrote that were not for the voice or that were purely orchestral. So there's something for everybody. But if you really want to get to know him, you've got to learn to enjoy the voice. Now, Britain's own style was a very personal amalgam of, of a bunch of different sort of 20th century trends. There was the Stravinskyan element of neoclassicism in some of what he did. He liked Baroque forms in his instrumental pieces. He liked Pasacalias, these Baroque suite form. He did not write sonata form movements, generally speaking. Uh, his style has been described as the ostinato style. An ostinato is simply a repeated rhythmic figure um, that accompanies a tune on top or some other sort of figuration. And, and that is basically what he did. He would find some sort of musical idea and then devise an ingenious accompaniment based on the, re the repetition of small fragments. And you'll hear that. You hear that in the first work on our list, the four C interludes and Pasacalia from Peter Grimes, the opera. Now you can go listen to the whole opera. It's a wonderful opera, it really is. It was the piece that put Britain on the map and that put English opera on the map. Um, it was composed in the 1940s, and it is uh, the story of a, a fisherman who's a loner, who, who is despised by the gossipy, spiteful little town that he lives in, the borough, and um, his apprentices, he has two of them, and they both die. Um, the first one dies, and they tell him, like, to fish all by himself and not get another apprentice. Well, he does. And the second one dies. And so they come after him and he, it's not his fault, by the way, that they die. Um, and he goes crazy and rows his boat out into the ocean and sinks it with him in it, drowning. It's a tragedy. Um, in the opera, there are these orchestral interludes, which Britain excerpted for a separate performance. And you can hear them here. <clears throat> and his style is very, very much in evidence. In, in, the, in this particular series of pieces. You've got Dawn, which alternates two patterns. You've got a, a long singing line in flutes and violins, like seagulls flapping around in the morning. And then you have the waves and the flutes and harps going and then the, the swell of the ocean in the brass. And these things just alternate side by side. You know, they get louder and louder and then quieter and quieter, and that's the first one. The second one is called Sunday Morning, and it's a classic case of the ostinato style because the horns are going bum, da, 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 like Sunday morning church bells. And on top of that, you have a melodic idea, dum, bum, 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 and then there's a more lyrical tune in the middle, and then it comes back, and that's that. And then we have Moonlight. Moonlight is repetition of a very simple rhythmic figure over and over again. And, uh, you know, with, with little bits of, of, of beams of light, moonbeams popping in the middle. Um, it's very tranquil and quite beautiful. And then the storm. And the storm is, of course, the ostinato style at its most potent 
you know, you've got you've got the melody on top and the rhythm on the bottom, and it's it's just great. Then we have the Pasacalia, which is the big interlude in the second act, when the when the town is is going after Peter Grimes, and we have the the huge scene in his hut after immediately afterwards, um, in which the the second apprentice falls to his death from a cliff. Anyway, uh, Pasacalia is a Baroque form where you have a repeated ostinato on the bass. Da, 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 dum, bum, bum. That just repeats over and over and over, orchestrated in different ways. It's almost like Ravel's Bolero when you think about it. Um, and over that, various themes and climaxes and things occur. It's a very powerful and very, very beautiful piece. And the actual theme of the Pasacalia comes from the words, and God have mercy upon them, um, which is in the previous scene. So it carries over. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. So these are perfectly lovely standalone pieces, and you can listen to the complete opera as well um, once you get to know them or before you get to know them and see what you think and give it a shot. But the next work is a complete opera. It's The Turn of the Screw. And I have no hesitation in saying that The Turn of the Screw is one of the shattering operatic masterpieces of the 20th century lyric stage, which is what you call the opera, lyric stage, if you want to be snooty about it. But The Turn of the Screw is a ghost story, a fabulous ghost story by Henry James. Um, and it's a novella, I think, originally. I don't know, I've read it several times. It's just fun to read, too. If you don't know The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, go read it. Anyway, it's, it was turned into a fabulous operatic libretto um, in which a governess comes to a mysterious country house where there's two children and a housekeeper and his jo her job is to watch over them and teach them. She's a governess. She does runs classes and all that. And she begins to discover that evil is afoot because the previous, previous um, valet or valet, as they call him in English speak, was Peter Quint and he did naughty things to the children, evidently. Exactly what happened, we never find out, but there's no question that the children are haunted. Um, in in the original story, you're not quite sure if the ghosts are real or they're figments of the governess's sexually repressed imagination or something like that, but, but um, in the opera, they are very real, the ghosts. They have scenes all to themselves, and they're just fabulous. And the cool thing about The Turn of the Screw, screw is that the entire opera is structured as a theme in variations. That is the screw theme, each variation representing another turn of the screw theme. And the theme is a 12 note theme. It uses all the notes of the chromatic scale, but it's quite tonal. It's yum, bum, ba, da, 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 sort of like that. It goes like that. The first variation is yum bum bum ba da dum bum ba da dum bum ba da 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 dum bum bum. Oh, it's just so much fun! I can't even tell you. I can sing the whole thing for you, and thereby turn you off to Benjamin Britten for the rest of your life. It's an incredible piece. It's about two hours long in two acts, and you just sit there with the words and let it happen. It's composed for chamber orchestra, an orchestra of only 12 or 13 people. But those 12 or 13 people play a whole slew of instruments. I mean, you've got oboes and English horns and flutes and piccolos and the usual strings and a vast assortment of percussion instruments and keyboard and things and harp and oh my gosh, it's just marvelous. The evil ghosts are represented by the Celesta. Very creepy. Super duper creepy. Oh, it's just amazing. So so if you really want to get into Benjamin Britten, then you have to hear the turn of the screw. Then we'll do an instrumental piece, his most famous one, The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. This was originally written for, as a film documentary. Um, it's a film score with narration explaining what the instruments of the orchestra are, but it's also a set of variations on a wonderful theme by Henry Purcell um, from, the, from the music to Abdelazar or The Moor's Revenge theatrical music by Purcell. And these variations are all written for separate instruments. And having disassembled the orchestra section by section by section, um, Britain proceeds to reassemble it in the form of a fugue 
at the end, which is on a totally different subject. It goes like that. And every instrument enters in the order of, that they entered in the variations. And when we get down to the percussion, the personal theme comes in in the brass to surmount everything and bring the piece to its glorious conclusion. 16 minutes of pure fun and it has a didactic purpose which Britain fulfills absolutely brilliantly, but you got to listen to it without the narration. Most performances are straight, but be careful. Take a look. Make sure if you're buying a CD. Then we have song cycles. Britain wrote num, num, a number of song cycles for his partner, um, Peter Pears, the famous English tenor. Um, most of them were written for him. Some were written for others as well. These include the Serenade for Tenor, Horn, and Strings, um, Les Illuminations, after um, erotic, somewhat erotic poetry by Rimbaud, they're in French, um, and The Nocturne, which is quite lovely. And all of these have, you know, fascinating, fascinating solos for various instruments along with the voice. And I've chosen The Serenade for Tenor, Horn, and Strings. It's his most famous work. Um, it has a brilliant part, obviously, for solo horn. Uh, it's a selection of poems, and we don't need to go into the details of the poems because you'll follow the poetry as it goes. And it's 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 a wonderful work, a wonderful work. But you, again, you need to like classical leader type singing, um, which is an acquired taste. It, it really is. But it's it's an amazing work. I mean, beautiful setting of the text, and you pay attention to just the way that Britain handles handles the words and the music, and then crafts the music to fit the words and and you'll probably fall in love or not. Either way, it's okay. And then we have choral music. I mean, Britain wrote tons and tons of choral music and he, some of it quite populist in style uh, because he was, he was always interested in getting people to participate in communal music making, communal singing. Um, one of his most famous examples of that is Noah's Flood, Noise Flood. Uh, which is just deliciously fun. It tells the story, of course, of the flood. Uh, his most famous choral work, his most popular one, is A Ceremony of Carols, one of the most the most well-known Christmas pieces written by a contemporary composer. The wonderful thing about A Ceremony of Carols is that it contains some familiar things, obviously, Christmas carols, but they're set in a way which is not writing down. He never dumbed down his music for his audience. He believed, and I think he was absolutely right, that that your average listener, especially your non-classical listener, frankly, is enormously more sophisticated and discerning than people give them credit for being. And so his music is 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 of that kind. It's of a very high standard, even when its intent is to be popular and easy to listen to. And a ceremony of carols accomplishes just that. And last but not least, certainly not least, his war requiem. Well, this is his choral masterpiece. It's a big, huge, monstrous setting of the Requiem in the Latin Requiem text. Um, the Requiem Mass, as you find in Mozart's Requiem, or Verdi's Requiem, or Faure's Requiem, or Berlioz's Requiem, all those people, it's all the same words, um, the Mass for the Dead. But it was also a, a, a huge anti-war protest piece it was written in the early 1960s, and um, it's an astonishing masterpiece. And what Britton does is he takes the Requiem text and he intersperses it with poems by Wilfred Owen, the British poet who was killed in World War I. Um, and so the result is really fabulous as the poems comment on the, the Latin text it's scored for just a huge array of forces. It's an enormous orchestra, plus a chamber orchestra, where you have um, a tenor and a baritone who represent the two soldiers reading the Owen poems. You have the main choir and a soprano soloist who enact the Latin ritual, and an offstage boys' choir with a chamber organ or off somewhere up there or somewhere. And these huge groups you know, enact this thing almost like an opera. It's a very theatrical piece of music and extremely powerful. And at the end, deeply, deeply moving. Um, and again, you just sit there with the words and let it happen, let it rip. And it's, it's one of the most devastating and powerful pieces of 20th century music. Um, and if you know these works, I mean, Britain's idea of taking, you know, a certain text and making these sort of compilation works um, it's all based on 
on, on the music of Mahler, who inspired him tremendously, Das Lied von der Erde, for example, his song symphony, which Britain did a couple of those. He did the Spring Symphony, um, and also Mahler's Eighth, which mixes a Latin text with the final scene from Goethe's Faust. That kind of textual eclecticism was one of Britain's hallmarks, and there are several works of his, his major works that do exactly that, interleave different texts from different sources to create an overall unified conception. And so the War Requiem is the greatest of those, and uh, you it'll just you know, knock your socks off. I mean, it's just terrific. And if you uh, don't know, like big choral music, well, again, Britain is a vocal music guy. Um, you know, I took me a while to get into Britain because I was a instrumental music person. I like symphonies. I like chamber works. I like things without words. Uh, and in order to enjoy Britain, I had to reconcile myself to the texted aspect, which most people have no trouble with, because most people listen to songs normally, I mean, especially people who like popular music rather than classical. They listen to songs with words. And so it's not a big deal. For me, it was a big deal. But but um, you may be one of those or the other of those, or you may be equally happy with both text and song, but Britain was one of the great composers to unite the two. So go get them and keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.